Welcome to Fuzzy Butts and Friends. I'm Luke Robinson, your host, your big dog. And unfortunately, my trusty co-host, Ginger Morgan, the executive director of um, Puppy Up, she has taken ill and she won't be with us today. So um, I'm in the driver's seat all alone. Of course, <laughs> I'm usually driving, I'm usually driving the car and uh, I don't think she's even really looking where I'm going most, most, most days. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, Ginger's great. Um, we wish her well. Hope she gets better and she'll be uh, hopefully on our next episode of Fuzzy, Fuzzy Butts and Friends. But speaking of friends, we have yet another one of our long-term friends with us today, Arden Moore. I don't know if I have enough time, Arden, in this show, uh, or at least the intro section, to talk about all the things that you've done in the world of fuzzy butts, both uh, canine and feline. Here, we'll so me, get into the mood. There you go. <laughs> that would be Casey. <laughs> so so why don't we introduce yourself, Arden, welcome to the show, and introduce all your friends that are with you. Well, pause up, Luke, and it's so nice to be on your Fuzzy Putt podcast. I love the name. Thanks, uh, you. You know, we, we met each other years ago when you were first doing uh, the, the walks in, in memory of Malcolm, which was pretty cool. And I love to see that you're still on that big fight to knock C out of the lineup, cancer. That's awesome. Um, I wear a lot of hats in the, in the pet world, a lot of collars, I guess you might say. I'm glad my last name is Moore. I love <laughs> what I'm doing because everything I'm doing is connected to my motto, which is bringing out the best in pets and their people. So I'm in it for the two, three, and four leaguers out there. And I know it's strange to see a CAT on your show, but he is probably the most active pet safety cat in the entire country, probably the world. And he is a certified therapy pet. He helps me in my Pet First Aid for You for veterinary approved Pet First Aid classes and my behavior talks. And Kona, wakey, wakey, Kona! <laughs> Come on, you want to come up here? Come on, come on. Oh, you can do it. Ready? Ready? Put on the job. Come on, Coney. You got that. Big close up. Hey, Coney. Like, how are you, buddy? Oh, Look at that. What a oh, handsome boy. Yes. She goes, I am a safety dog, too. Put your head down so we can see it. There we go. And uh, she is also a therapy pet. Uh, she's my best friend. He's my BFF. Best I got it. I got it reverse. I just called Kona a boy, and Casey's the boy, and Kona's the girl, right? She says that's okay, Mr. Luke. I love you. <laughs> They're well, both. Uh, there's girls. a weird thing these days, anyway. So that's all. That's all good. They're um, both shelter alums from uh, <laughs> California. I don't call them rescues. I call them alums because I love the work at shelters. And I got to tell you. She's the most intuitive dog I've ever had. She knows how to bring up energy, bring down energy when meeting a dog, a CAT, people. She reads your emotional state. We go to memory care centers, schools, kid camps, and you should see them in person or Zoom teaching pet first aid. Kona and Casey, they're my A-team. What do you think, Luke? You know, I, Kona, they're, they're gorgeous. I, I love them. And Kona, I love. So, so. First of all, how young is she? Uh, Kona is a young, just turned seven. All right. Um, and and Casey is also seven. So they're primetime players. I and think so it's hilarious. She's, she's giving you a big close-up. She looks massive, but she's on my uh, little cushion table. <laughs> well, I, I was actually, this is a true fact about, about me. I was actually born the year of the dog. So I actually am a dog. Um, and so like it's that. good. It's good. And like 99.99% of all the dogs I meet on my travel are absolutely, I mean, we're, we're part of the tribe, part of the, 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 her, the pack is, as it were, but, but there have been a couple that for whatever reason, they don't look, they don't, they have not liked me, but I, it's interesting to see that, that, that dog to dog bond yeah. translates through the laptop, through the internet. Um, exactly. So she's she's Kona's gorgeous. Thank you. I think this is a, this is the first dog that we've actually truly had on our show. Mine, my knucklehead. The first cat. <laughs> definitely the first cat. <laughs> well, <laughs> just for all you dog lovers out there, my sister is dog, dog, dog. This is the only cat she loves because he acts more dog than most dogs. He walks on a leash. He <laughs> and he and, K and Kona make a, a really good team. So. Um, I threw a dog, a cat at you, but it's just a very extraordinary cat. 
Well, well, mine, I, you know, it's interesting. There, there's a big debate as to whether Fuzzy Butts and Friends actually includes cats. I'm a dog <laughs> guy. I was born the year of the dog. And, yeah. um, but I love all animals. It's great to have, uh, it's great to have them on the show, but I wish I could get mine on the show or somehow include him, but, but my knucklehead, Grayson, he's <laughs> over there sleeping on his Corunda bed where he does most episodes. So, um, I got, I don't know what we're paying him, um, uh, but, uh, he certainly isn't living up to it, but I love your pack. You got a great, a great crew over there, Arden. Thank you so much for being a part of our, yeah, yeah, yeah. they make me a better human. They do. They, 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 all, they, they do. We have so much to cover because that's such an important topic that I never talk enough about is uh, I always talk about dogs being a model for us understanding cancer and people. But I, I don't talk enough about dogs being a model for us as, as human beings, as humanity. But before we jump into that, we just I, I you jump all over the place. I do, too. It's going to be a fun episode. It's going to be crazy and chaotic. I love it. Already, nobody's gonna but, snore. Nobody's gonna be snoring on this one. That, that's that's true. That's true. Um, but before we get go anywhere else, um, I did wanted to to reference something that you said. It's good to see you still going. And I'm not sure if you knew heard this, but I lost my third dog to cancer last September, and so I'm about to get on walk Hudson. three. Hudson, right? Hudson's what? Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, I'm still getting over and still cry every day. But I still can't talk about it or really look him or look about uh, looking pictures of him. And uh, but uh, but, you know, um, despite that, um, I am a lifer in this. I'm here till the end of my life because, uh, you know, there are six million new cases of cancer in dogs every year. Now, the numbers are off the charts. It's the greatest pandemic uh, that uh, our canine companions, our loved ones, our kids. Yeah. Um, I've ever faced in the history uh, of the world that I know of. And this is an all, we're at the all in stage right now. I like I like Everybody, exactly. every pet exactly. parent has got to be engaged, has got to be paying attention. They got to be doing everything they can to learn because I meet people all the time and they've learned. I've only lost three. Ginger's lost eight. I meet people that lost like all 100% of their golden retrievers to cancer. So, so, so I'm all in for the rest of my life. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of guy when I do something that I believe in, I'm the first in and last out. And for me, last out will be until the day I die. So thank you for recognizing that most, some people don't, don't realize. And it's really important because I meet so many pet parents on my travels and, 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 and I love them to death, but I, but and, and they go through cancer and they lose a dog to cancer. And then the cycle of life, they get a wonderful new puppy. And then the sort of the priorities shift. And I understand that. I get it. But but the numbers are so shocking now that the chances are they're going to have another cancer kid um, within a very short period of time. So we need to keep people engaged. That's why Fuzzy Butts and Friends is here to stay. And so Arden, whatever you can do and whatever we can do together to keep yeah. this word out there. So let's kick this thing off. So tell me. <laughs> Tell me all about, I gotta know, first off, you, you, you've done so many firsts. You're, you're so big, it's crazy in this business. It's crazy. But I'm only, so, I'm under five too, so I'm not that big. Well, well, short <laughs> in stature, but- I have a very but, radio voice, so there you go. <laughs> short in stature, but giant, giant in reality. Um, so how did you become, uh, I love this title, how did you become America's pet health and safety coach? I gave the title to myself. Love it, I do it all the time. <laughs> but, but the point is this, uh, for many years, I was focusing on uh, uh, play with a purpose. I actually created National Dog Party Day. I uh, got into the world of behavior and health. And I realized there was a big piece of the pet puzzle missing, and that was safety. So for the past 12 years, I am a master instructor in pet first aid, CPR, and safety. And when you put those all together, you might have an opportunity to catch things early in your pet, know what to do when uh-oh happens with your pet, and have a better bond with your pet. So for all those reasons, and to have a great teaching team in Kona and Casey, uh, we are doing our doggone best to uh, <laughs> help people learn, understand the need for pet first aid. Everything we do is approved by, um, by veterinarians. But I think the title, I, I, I take it with uh, humility because we have saved pets' lives. 
just like you're doing, Luke, with your cancer education and your causes, you know, if we could just clone ourselves and others in the same vein, uh, you know, pets would live longer, healthier, happier lives. Well, that's that's absolutely true. And that's kind of people ask me what's really the, the what's the vision with with Fuzzy Butts and Friends. And I'm like, it's not just about our companions with cancer. It's about everything that prevents that. And that includes enriching their lives, because Arden, I'm sure, as you know, one thing that we, we don't have the statistical data. There's so much data that we don't have, unfortunately. But I know it. You know it that uh, a dog, a, a companion that has a, a person, every living thing, I believe, that has an enriched life uh, mm -hmm. lives a longer life, a better life. I, I believe yeah. that, and I think that's really what our job's about, don't you? Uh, absolutely, and I am so lucky, uh, Luke, because Kona and Zeke are actually my second set of safety team. Uh, years ago, I had a husky mix named Chipper and a gray and white cat named Zeke, and they're up in heaven uh, waiting for us. Uh, take your time, guys. I'll be there in a long while. Um, and, uh, and so these two from the shelters showed me they want to uh, help people and their pets. So I'm very, very, very blessed to have a second set of a dog and a cat teammate. What do you think? I think you're doing a great he job. He loves what you talked about. Look at that. Oh, yeah, this is awesome. You just can't oh, talk no, I'm, I'm, glad she, I'm glad she's sitting finally. She was standing up, and you can't see her, her gorgeous face so much. And look at that. Look at the oh, she has very good teeth. Yeah, she's, she's got very like, good teeth. She's, she's like, it's just humans yap, 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 yap. Um, but but, but, but what, what fascinates me, Art, Art, and I apologize. That's my voice going out. Um, I'm not... Uh, I heard puberty. you were going through puberty finally. I was you know. going to say I'm not, not going through puberty a second time. Thank goodness. I <clears throat> might have to neuter me again. Um, but uh, what I love is that is that Kona and, and Casey are more than just props on your show. They actually oh, are wow. part of the they're part of the instruction process. So can oh, you yeah. have a, do you have a demonstration for us? Kona, you want to do something? Okay, we're gonna let's do uh, Kona. Come here. I might have to push this back a little bit, but hang on. That, I'm, go, I'm sure that's that's not her best side. No, it's no, not, that's others. Right. It, it is. All right. So one thing, you got this, Kona. Here we go. We're gonna put this over here. Sometimes, uh, uh oh, happens, and your dog will have uh, either not put full weight on a leg, or you don't know if it's a break, a sprain, or a strain unless the bone has erupted through. So for simple fractures, sprains, strains. In our class, we actually do a splint. Now, here comes, you, ha you haven't heard from me for a while, Luke. I'm full of puns and sing in my classes. <laughs> because people learn when they're having fun, when they're feeling safe, and when they have something easy to remember, like a rhyme or something. So in this demo, I teach many things called how to be a mutt giver. <laughs> I love it. MacGyver. Love it. What do you do when uh-oh happens and you don't have a pet first aid kit? So you're out hiking with your dogs and they come up lame, one of their front legs. So in a quick demo, you ready for this, Kona? You got this. I got this. I know this. Um, everybody's been shopping at um, Chewy and Amazon. Save some of that bubble wrap. You probably have a bandana on the hike. I know you're probably not doing your nails on a hike, uh, but you do can get sticks that would be the length of the pet's leg. We show, first of all, you always have to muzzle your pet so we can show that in a little bit, but Kona's gonna help me. Kona's got her right leg. That's, oh, watch, she'll even pull it up. Let me see if I can get this square. All right, Kona, it's your right leg. There you go, my girl. Um, <laughs> she does that. So the key to setting, uh, doing a little makeshift splint before you can get to the vet is, look, she helps me, is to put something around the leg that's a cushion. In this case, I'm using bubble wrap, but you can use um, cloth, washcloth, you can use a magazine, newspapers. The second thing has to be what we call the stabilizer. It's gotta be either side to side or front to back to keep that ankle and elbow joint from moving because you don't want to cause further in injury to the limb. And then you can either use gauze, uh, you can use uh, shoelaces, 
whatever you have on you. And then I'm using a bandana and you just tie it all together. And Kona has now got a splint. Then you can take your leash, depending on the size of the dog, put it under their arms up like this and be able to take weight off of the limb. But here's a good one. If you have a huge dog bigger than Kona, always in your car and in your travels, camping and your long walks that you're doing, take an Ikea bag. They only cost like a buck or two. Cut the lengths off, leave the handles on. It is sturdy, durable, cheap, lightweight, and you have a makeshift gurney with handles. I love I love that idea. I, I'm not an Ikea person. I'm just not much of a shopper or a consumer. Yeah, unless, yeah, I don't go there much. Just, they trap you. You've got to go but, in and you have to go like a mouse in the maze all the way to the end. But, but my, grab a couple of these yeah. on your trip. Also, for people, if there's an injury in the house, my dad was an engineer, so I got a little engineer in me. Because these are coated, they don't cause friction when you drag a heavy dog across um, um, the carpet, like a blanket or a rug will. Well, I know I, I do, but I, I, I'm not a consumer, but I, a friend introduced me to the Ikea bag a few years ago, and I travel a lot, so I, I have a number of those, and there I love go. those bags, and I love the idea and I will take some of those in my one of those in my backpack. So thank you for that tip. Are they? I guess they call them bags. <laughs> Kona, Kona did such a great job. For those people that are listening on um, Spotify or I, or I Heart Radio or any one of the other podcast platforms, um, Kona was did a wonderful job of she allowed Arden to, to splint her leg, and she did so great. Kona, you're great. Now, do you give treats? Does Kona get a treat after working for you? Oh, or you? Yes, I will. But the I problem is to... I have a feline, other feline in the house named um, Rusty, the performer. And the minute I bring out the T-R-E-A-T's, he's going to go flying across the screen. So Okay, that's good to hear because I'd, I'd hate to have to report you to, to the dog version of OSHA if you're not well, compensating... That... You're, yes. you're, you're not giving enough treats per hour. Or rest no, I, I, hour. I will, but um, this is the um, this is the monster. That hey, it's Casey. This is Rusty. And oh, that's Rusty. Okay. He, yeah, he comes from the um, amazing Acro Cats. He was a circus cat. I, I just noticed that all of your all of your animals, all of your kids, have <laughs> the same color coat color as your hair. I oh. just, <laughs> I just noticed that in the frame, they all match your hair, except Emma. Where's Emma? Where did she okay. go? I'll get her. Come here. Lay down. Uh, tell us Emma's story. Emma is the smallest dog, everyone, that I've ever had. Good girl. Emma is about nine pounds. We did the DNA. She's got poodle mostly, thank goodness. She's got chihuahua. Yay, 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 yay. But she's got Maltese. Yorkie and Pomeranian. But March 2020, the time all the fun started here with COVID, she was in our neighborhood with no collar, no microchip. And I got to tell you, Luke, she kind of looked like um, a guest star on The Walking Dead. She was like, <laughs> <clears throat> and she had no energy. She was like brownish in her color. She looked horrible. Uh, but she, I looked at her teeth and, and even my vet agreed, she was only about a year old. Guess what? Full of heartworm. Oh no. Oh, so we, we took a long time. We have a great veterinarian, Dr. Deborah Charles at Casa Linda Animal Hospital, went through all the protocols. We actually put her in a stroller because at the time we had our 90 pound dog, Bujo, who was our Bernese Mountain Dog Mix in Kona. And we'd take the three of them for walks, but she couldn't expend any energy, as all you know who have heartworm dogs, because you don't want the heart going yeah. faster to make more heartworms. So she would be in the stroller to get her vitamin D when we took the dogs for walks. And I'm happy to say she's completely healed. Oh, do you want me to brag? Yeah, and you need to brag, because finally I've taken her to What a Great Dog. She's done three levels of canine obedience, aced them. And we graduate, pause cross, Monday night for her to earn her canine good citizen. And That's then wonderful. we're on to be in a therapy dog. 
I got to tell you, you know me, I love medium to large dogs, never had a tiny one like this, but she is a DOG, four on the floor, not a purse my ride. She's gorgeous, and congratulations to a successful treatment of heartworms. <laughs> I just before you moved on, I wanted to I wanted to get something in before you're like me. We jump around a lot. But before you moved on, it's also very timely and time appropriate for me because I'm not sure if you've heard my three-legged Great Pyrenees Grayson, um, whom I, I I had no intention of of getting another Pyrenees. Um, I had two at the time. I only like to have two enough that I can carry out of the force one underneath each arm. But uh, I fostered one for the National Great Pyrenees Rescue, a wonderful organization. And uh, and so I don't know what I was thinking. Um, and I, I just, it happened so quickly and I ended up with the three-legged Pyrenees, but he was heartworm pro positive, uh, knew that, but they had the low dose treatment. And anyway, to make a long story short, um, and, and not and get mired down in the specifics, it, it turned out that that low dose treatment, it, it keeps the, the uh, new eggs from developing, but it doesn't really address the adult heartworm. So he has a, okay. an adult heartworm, it, not a lot, but it's there, it's certainly, and so it's, it's affected uh, our plans for walk three a little bit. And, but more importantly, my, I'm, I like you, I'm, 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 I have nightmares all the time. I'm worried about it, Grayson all day long about him. And anytime he gets excited, I'm like, whoa, there, big fella. Hold yeah. on there. You know, you need to settle down there, pal. And, um, and uh, because you have that fear that at any time he could throw that, uh, that heartworm, that disgusting parasite that, yeah. that resides in, in the, the hearts and, and the, the bodies of our beautiful kids. And then it could kill them, could throw, throw a clot or do whatever it does to kill, to kill them. So I'm going through that. Thank God that Emma's okay. But you were yeah, talking about- Yeah, she had pretty aggressive treatment and we have had two checks and obviously she's on heartworm preventative now and all that, but she is absolutely clean of heartworm. Good, good, good to hear, good. good but it took thank a long time, it took a long time. And uh, I just saw her personality blossom and she thinks cats are gods because she lives with the cats. She thinks Casey, Kona is oh. her big sister I, and she has never met a stranger. I, I, I have no remedy. I have no remedy about that, 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 that Emma thinks cats are gods. Maybe I'll meet oh. Emma in person and she and I can have a conversation. You guys can have a, a, a dog to dog talk because right now she's the smallest pet in our house. <laughs> Maybe that has something to do with it. She goes, okay, I'm gonna go back to the couch. Okay. Bye bye, bye bye Emma. But thank you for asking about her because you never, you know, you never know when a dog will come in your life and there's always a good reason. And with K Kona's case, she was a two-time shelter reject in California and I was going back there. I now live in Dallas, but I lived in Oceanside, California for many years and was going to the Rancho um, Coastal Humane Society and she and I connected I, and I did every darn temperament test including must like cats because she has to be good around cats. Well, I never get to that point with my kids, unfortunately, because oh. <laughs> mine started out, here, let me give you the chronology of mine. Malcolm was a gift from an ex, or I don't remember actually saying yes to him, but somehow I ended up with him anyway. But I really liked her and she was wonderful. And, and I try, but I tried to get rid of Malcolm mm -hmm. and, and it didn't work and it changed my life forever. So thank God for that. And then Murphy was also a gift from uh, uh, an ex. Somehow I kept getting <laughs> dogs from- a pattern here, Luke. <laughs> sometimes I, I kept getting dogs from women and I kept the dogs and lost the women. So I ended up ahead. And then, then um, oh. Hudson and Indiana and Grayson are all rescues from shelters okay. because because God God knows that that shelters need there's so many wonderful dogs out there that need needs need adopting. But before we move on, you mentioned DNA testing, and I've thought about that. I've never I don't think I've ever had it done with my kids. I think it, I, so. I did it. Uh, I'm not going to name the brand, but yep. I was just you know you're kind of curious what it is. But I'll give you two things, and I I'll probably never get them to ever sponsor any of my shows or talks or programs. But Kona was. DNA came back as a pit bull German Shepherd when she's clearly terrier on terrier on terrier, maybe with a little whippet. Emma, um, I, I think she does have poodle toy poodle in her, and I can see some of the features of a Chihuahua. So the second test was a little bit, I think, 
more accurate based on her looks and her personality and how she walks and things like that. But <coughs> in fairness, there's over 200 recognized breeds by the American Kennel Club. I mean, of all the species on this planet, we have tinkered with dogs more than any other species. So you got dogs who can hold the palm of your hand and dogs who can hold you in the palm of their paw. And uh, so in fair, they're just getting all the little DNA markers. Every year, I think these companies are getting more precise. Right, well, but, and I and I, I know I know some people I know some people that have done it and uh, taken the test for their kids and it turned out to be pretty darn accurate and I know some that have taken the test and it's like thirty seven <laughs> different kinds but I I know one thing and I and I probably will but I know one thing for sure Arden Morris I know those DNA d d tests do not test for uh, part potted plant uh, which is what Grayson is he's part <laughs> knuck he's part knucklehead. Um, that's another part in his DNA. Another part is he's an ingrate. He doesn't love his father. <clears throat> that's another, <laughs> that's, that's well ingrained in his DNA. Um, that probably comes down. He's a stubborn some bitch. Um, now that's, that's thousands of years of Pyrenees. I know that. Wow. Um, wow. So I'm not but sure. You still love him. <laughs> I love, oh my God. I love him to death. I do. I'm, I'm being funny, of course, but, uh, but, but you've, you've had a burner. So you've had, you, you know what I'm talking about on those those ancient breed dogs where they have thousands of years oh, yeah, of yeah, behaviors yeah. ingrained in them. Yeah. yeah, Bujo, the Bernese Mountain Dog Mix had some Catahoula in her. You could see the white speckled paws, but what a great tempered dog, you know, and she, she I called her my big black mountain. She yeah. was awesome. And uh, she actually passed away a year ago, March 30th. Um, not to be a downer, but I do teach pet first aid and, uh, it was 1.50 in the morning, we heard her coughing and I jumped out of bed and I teach everybody to be in the present moment. You can't do anything about what happened. You don't have a lot of control of the future, but you can do a lot in, in the, as my cat would say, the me now. And you have to do the best you can in the circumstances you're in with the skills you have. So I hopped right down and I was doing six sets of chest compressions and rescue breaths and I noticed her tongue was blue and she passed away. And my veterinarian, I love her because she just tells it like it is. She said, Arden, I could have been right there next to you with Bujo and I could not have saved her. She died of a heart attack. And she said, and think about it. That was right in the heart of all the crappy COVID where you had to be in your car while they were in the vet clinic. She goes, maybe she wanted to go at home with you. Maybe she wanted to say goodbye at home. And I know it doesn't help, you know, we've lost good pets, but I've done CPR four times and my batting average is I've saved two. So wow. that's pretty good um, because yes. the average is about 20 or 30%. So I did it, I gave it my all loop because I, but she was 10 and a half years old. You know, that's a good age for a 90 plus dog, but she was just, she was my big black mountain. Well, and yeah, right. Yeah, I understand that guilt. Pardon me, I'm kind of, my voice is cracking. Um, I know I that guilt. I would the the thing, uh, um, you know, uh, Ricola. <laughs> yeah, I, um, uh, I know that guilt uh, and I understand it is that you do everything that you can and you just, you can't save them and you don't get, you don't get the outcome that you want. Um, and, but, but I but don't I, want I, people to, but don't think of it as guilt, because if you do the best you can in the circumstances you're in with what you know, I want you, it's hard, but I want people to understand you gave them a better fighting chance than you would have had you not learned something like first aid or been cognizant about their health cues. Right. So, well, I, I, I do. I'm not, I, I'm fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not sure which word to use. I've never had to use first aid measures on my kids, but I'm talking about the, the, the losing, the actual losing. Yeah. And, and when you're fighting a disease that in the end it's terminal, that there is the, there's the guilt. Some people call it survivor guilt. I don't really think that that's it. Just you, you expend everything that you, you think of everything, you do everything in your power to, to save your loved one and you don't get the outcome and you, and you, and you feel the get for, for me, 
that guilt is important. I need that guilt and I need that pain because I'm, okay. it drives me in its power inside me. So I need that. So I understand what you're saying about try not to take unnecessary guilt or beat yourself up when you expend all life-saving measures. But I was fighting against a, a, a yeah. terminal, terminal yeah. disease. Please so it was in yeah, losing. That's different. That's Absolutely. different than, but I'm yeah, surprised. Absolutely. But what fascinates me, Arden, is I'm surprised about the numbers. That's wonderful that you have a one out of two, uh, 50% chance success. Uh, is that normal for people that that perform? No. So it's, why, uh, why is that? Tell us about that. Well, ER and critical care veterinarians don't have the definitive data about what the rate is, but they're best educated guests. And these people have Vanna White initials after their name. There, many of them are my mentors for my Pet First Aid for You program. Uh, the average is about 20, 30% and, and survive given immediate chest compressions and rescue breaths. And a lot of it just has to do with maybe the health of the pet, how immediately you went to try to get that beautiful heart muscle pumping again, because it's pumping all that great oxygenated goodies to the bloodstream, the respiratory system, the circulatory system, the lungs, the heart, the liver, the brain. And timing is a lot of it and technique and you know the age of the pet. Do they have a compromised immune system? I mean, there's it's a crapshoot to tell you, to be blunt. And I just know that no matter what, I'm one of those people that is, uh-oh happens, I actually go to it. I don't freeze. And we actually in our classes help people learn how to unfreeze because you know think about pets during covid especially they have they have brought up our a game they have been through all the crap while we were staying at home and who were they they were our most loyal buddies they didn't change they didn't you know change the channel you know <laughs> they didn't argue with you um I just think they brought so much goodness and they continue to do so. So that's well, my way of giving back. I think you mentioned something that's so key to understanding the difference in the success rate with CPR and, and not, not just CPR, any critical situation. And that is freezing, which means yeah. that you don't have muscle memory because for me on the road, and I didn't want to make this whole episode about walk three and all of the endemic risks that we're going to be facing we walking, to that walking 400 miles but 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 what you said is perfect is that for me it's all muscle memory i have to be able to so i've got six months or so until we start walk three and everything i do is is going to be training my muscles to be able to respond in a crisis and situation muscle, right the brain right. the brain muscle Right, exactly. Yeah. And the more repetition that you do, the more it becomes instinctive. So you, so you said the key thing. CPR training is not like you have to be an expert or a genius or anything like that. It's just, it's just repetition. So let's focus on that, stay on that. So how often in your experience are, do, do pet parents really need to go through a drill or a routine of the critical care procedures that you, that you teach so that they don't lose that muscle memory and they don't freeze? Well, the classes we teach are veterinary approved. We've got 12 advisors on our team and they are with ER, critical care, internal medicine, feline medicine, household medicine. Dr. Marty Becker is one of them. I tag along with a, a couple of local ER vets here in the Dallas area to keep learning. I spend, a, I give up a night and spend it in the ER, but Everyone that takes the class, whether in person or Zoom, earns a two-year certificate. But what I try to teach people in class is work in what you've learned in your everyday life. And in, if your dog knows a sit and a stay, yay. Now practice how to put a makeshift muzzle on your dog or how to carry them in an Ikea gurney bag and give them high value rewards. So you're still honing in your skills. And every time you do something to help a pet who needs help in an injury situation, you talk out loud for three reasons. To help you remember it, to talk to that pet who may be in and out of consciousness, and someone else may hear you to assist. So it's like throwing wet pasta on a wall. The more you say it, the more you do it, 
the better it sticks. And, and so that's how we teach our class. And, and so pets, you know, are all about predictability. So if you can train a healthy dog how to use your six foot leash and do a quick makeshift muzzle and get, take it off and give them a reward, make it a game, then when they are hurt, they're not gonna be biting you because they know this is coming on because I'm gonna get a treat in a bit, but you be able to do, to render aid safely without them, you know, making you a member of the Van Gogh family, taking off your ear. So we do focus on that. We also, you know this perfectly, Luke, they read our emotional states. They smell our states. And I'm a fear-free pet national speaker, and I'm all about reducing fear, anxiety, and stress. So we never say to an injured dog, oh, I'm so sorry, you're hurt. Baby talk to a dog that goes by rank is like the dog, pardon my French, is like crap. Can I get a human that's a higher rank? Um, I don't want to be the captain now. Or you don't apologize. Never say the word I'm sorry because it makes the dog feel like they have less of a chance of getting through this. If you say things like, hey, I, I gotcha. I'm here for you. Come on, let's do it. And you're in a calm and a confident voice, fake it till you make it and freak out later. You will do so much better to help your own dog. Yeah, you know, that's a sage advice, <clears throat> especially on the road. Um, I, I don't come from the training world, and training is a big part of what work that we're going to be doing before we get on, uh, on the road to walk three. But um, I, all of my understanding of, of dogs really comes through being on the road. Oh, yeah. For um, over three years, um, 4,000 miles now. And that part, it is 4,000 miles over three years, li living in tents, be being out there on, on the road, risking our lives, which on the West Coast was on the, the Pacific Coast Highway. There were times where two, two lanes um, to the right of us was a, a 200 foot drop off into the Pacific Ocean. To the left of us was a 100 foot cliff into the mountains. And you have razor thin uh, shoulders, and it was two dogs and myself with gear on. Oh my god! Um, so those—that's the reality of life on the road um, with your dogs, backpacking for a cause in America, and not doing it on nature trails. And so, um, what's critical, and you just said the word, the phrase there is trust. Trust is. is so it's critical trust. with your companion, and. And, and, and you need to establish that trust prior to any critical situation. That trust has to exist for, because if you don't have that trusting relationship in the moment of crisis or emergency, you're, you might not get that, the, the result that you expect, or your, your companion might not know what to do or what you're trying to do. And that miscommunication could be costly. And so I'm yeah. glad that we're talking about it because it's one of the most important things I've learned is I ha and that's really a lot of what I do now is trying to, because I do not have a trusting relationship ah. yet with Grayson. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, but you recognize that. Well, yeah, but because it takes time. It takes time. You can't, it's not something you could fake. I can, I can walk and I can say, let's go walk for a mile or two miles, but that's, that's entirely different than being out there when you're, you've got gear on, when the, the conditions are, are riskier, you've got cars coming at you. So it's something that you can plan and prepare for, but ultimately you have to put it to test out there and then just hope that you, that you, that the, the partnership um, is trusting and you can, you can lean into that when an emergency does happen. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. knock on, fortunately, knock on wood, I have not had an emergency situation um, on, on any of those 4,000 miles other than just vomiting and just uh, some other things like that. Um, but uh, and hopefully we won't have to put to the test, but you, you've got to have that trusting relationship, sure. Absolutely. And how, that do you, how, how do you teach that? Hold on a second. Before we leave that, uh, before we lose that, how do you, do, you, do you teach that in your courses? Do you, do you, do you emphasize that? How do you, do you, do you emphasize? Yeah, we, we emphasize the, the dog person, dog, a cat person bond. And it, you know, it's all about trust and, Dogs don't like to be with a human that gives them mixed signals. So they like things to be clear, concise, and consistent. And, and we do incorporate that in our teaching because 
They want predictability. They want to know what to expect. So if you're on a trail with your dog, Luke's, and, and you're like, come now, they know and that voice, that's a voice that says, I don't sit and smell the roses. I'm coming to daddy right now. That's, the that's, voice, that's, your train, that's your training business. That's not, you don't. No, do I don't, I'm not a dog trainer. I'm not a dog trainer. I'm, I'm more in the field of behavior and okay. person. I'm not a dog trainer. But do you, do you do that? Do you do that teaching in your, 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 your yeah. pet? Person? Yeah, we get into the mental game. Wow, that's wonderful. State. We teach people how to be pet detectives okay. because in essence, when you're out on that trail for walk three, you are going to be a first responder. And Absolutely. a first responder is always incorporating, looking 360, we do it the 360, forward, left, right, up, down, behind you, looking, listening, smelling, safely touching, gathering clues to avert an uh-oh. So I teach people to keep their eyes wide open, their ears open, their nose going and safely touching. And these clues you share when you get to a vet clinic quickly because time is ticking. This is not the time to tell them how much you love your dog and how you better save them and the emotional thing. These are the facts. I've done six sets of CPR and my dog, I'm about seven minutes away from the clinic. Kaboom, let them tell you what to do next. When the dog is at the vet clinic and you have safely sent the dog to the, the vet team, freak out, freak out. Give yourself the time for the adrenaline to drain because that's what all first responders do. Yeah, absolutely. That's just such wonderful advice, especially about the, the need to be decisive is that nature in the natural world, you have zero time to, to, to make the zero decisions, the right decisions, the decisions that save your life. And, exactly. and the, lear the learning curve for, for in the, the learning curve in the animal world is so short. Animals have to learn very quickly or they die. And so That's they right. look to, exactly. And so they look to humans who are on one side of the leash is that, hey, I'm actually putting my life in your hand, pal. And so, yeah. so, so you're in control of me because at least in the case with my Pyrenees, I know this because Pyrenees have thousands of years of instinct of being left alone. They don't really need humans. In right. fact, my, my Pyrenees remind me that every day, hey, hey, Poppy, <laughs> I don't need you at all except to put food there and, and whatever else I want, I'll let you know. And that's it. So put my face okay. on Facebook, that's what he's saying. That's right, exactly, exactly. Make, make me an, an influencer on TikTok, <laughs> which, which, which Grayson is the three-legged uh, three <laughs> Pyrenees on TikTok. So, but, but th that's it's absolutely right, is that they, they look to you because dogs, most dog breeds have that innate sense of self survival skills. They know what they're doing. Nature taught them that. They, they don't mess around. And so people get in the way and in many cases, people screw it up because people don't have those instincts. They don't, and those in, or those instincts aren't honed like dogs are. And so, so dogs look to us. Hey, buddy, if you're going to take me a walk on a walk uh, around the block, um, in the traffic, or, or across the country, you better know what you're doing. And if and if there's something happens, you better know how to respond and respond quickly. I love that message, Arden. Wow, it's great talking to you. That's exciting, but. I want to kind of take a side Mike trip. <laughs> I love it. I want to take a side trip from that. And you mentioned about uh, about control uh, and working with 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 your dogs and your cats. I have zero experience. Of course, I I have a hard enough time working with my dogs, much as my cats. But you have Casey there, and Casey is a part of your pro your show too, right? What does Casey do? Casey does first aid demos and also answers every question out loud during class. He's quite verbal. Uh, but what I've learned is cats are not small dogs. I get to work with a lot of feline behaviorists and internal medicine folks. And the best advice I ever got for any of you that have a cat and a dog out there is with cats, you never force, you always negotiate. So in our classes, we teach people that unlike dogs, cats, let me demo straight. Come here, wake up. Ugh. He says, Casey says, we have five weapons of mass destruction and we don't apologize. Unlike a dog, we also have a flexible spine. 
and we will make any Olympic pole vaulter look really lame because Casey can sit at this table right here, stand up and jump seven times his height. That's, Respect. Something, else. That, that's Respect. something else. <laughs> I, I love it because because it, 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 and the reality is is that is that everyone that has in all seriousness, yeah, and I, and I can't talk about this enough, anyone that has a companion in their care, it doesn't matter if it's a ferret, a chinchilla, a cat, <laughs> a dog, a parrot. Whatever. I haven't done CPR on chinchillas yet. <laughs> but, but at least, but 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 at least you, you better know what you better know what to do or what steps you need to take or have some sort of help because because when you when you take something out of the natural world, that's a responsibility yeah. and it's a serious responsibility and that includes first aid care and and proper yeah. pet. And it's the care. thing I'm the most passionate about of all the things I do, Luke. I see that. Yeah. I, saving lives but we're having fun like people don't know what hand to use to do chest compression so i talked to my very esteemed veterinary advisors you know with all their initials after their name and i said people keep thinking the dog has to be on one side or the other but the heart's in the middle between the front elbows so i said why don't i do this for safety you want the hand closest to the rump does the pump <laughs> And so when you do that, you have that other hand by their head and neck. So if they have a startle awake, you can just drop that hand down to keep yourself from getting chewed. But everybody in class is now saying the hand that does the pump is closest to the rump and the palm is the pump because it has I'm, all the bones. I'm dyslexic, so I hope I don't get those in reverse. Um, so uh, <laughs> well, you can say what pumps is, is is near the rump. You can do whatever you want, Luke, but that's how we try to do it, make it a rhyme. And you're gonna be right. going out in, when the weather can get colder and warmer. And we never ever put ice on a hot dog because, you know, in the words of vanilla ice, 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 not nice, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you actually do that better than vanilla ice himself. Um, Thank you. So I hear something he's in the remodel business these days. So yeah, he is. Uh, well, that's but okay. you know that, I, I love but I love I love that I, I love that you I love that you incorporate um it's important to incorporate culture and modern culture and and any anything that can help people learn um right. and assist in the okay. learning process, whether it's mnemonics or yeah. or whatever whatever useful learning tool, because it is a lot of information. And I know we kind of gloss over it because you and I um, you certainly a lot more than me have, have more training, but but even me, um, like I want to use Hudson for example, and I don't want to talk about it too much because I'll just start crying. But when Hudson was was had, was struggling uh, a secondary to a reaction to the chemo, um, his blood pressure dropped and he collapsed. And 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 um, you just you my instinct, given all the things I know, is just to look around for anybody for freaking help. And you just get you're scared as hell. Your heart drops. You don't know what to do. You're, it's just a frightening place to be. It, it, it is. And, it, it's, it's and so, it's so what you but do when is- you know it, that you're going to have permission to freak out later and you take a class, whether it's by me or anybody else, and they're teaching you what to do in the present moment, it really does help a lot. You look for their gums. Are they paling in color? Are they not bubblegum pink anymore? You get all the other distractions out of the room, the other dogs, cats, kids, whatever. And you'll be able to keep them from bumping their head into a corner of a coffee table if they happen to go into a seizure. So we teach all of that because it is doing things. If there's a car accident, I've had this happen. I've seen a dog get hit by a car and the person comes, you know, uh, coming out, you know, and you give them something to do. Can you go in your car and get a towel? Can you call the vet while you tend to the to the pet? Because that way, for those few minutes that could be the, the, the life or death, at least you have somebody there that knows how to apply pressure on an arterial wound that's bleeding. That's so, so much. Yeah, there's so like much that? information, but that right in of itself is there just so much. I mean, that speaks to there's so much information that you have to keep in your head while but while suppressing repressing your emotion your emotional response and, and trying to maintain a mental acuity and focus and so so you there's a lot for people to learn so one of the things i also love learning about you as well 
is that <laughs> you have a podcast, but not only do you have a podcast, so your competition, my, you actually have the oldest pet podcast out there. Is that right? Yeah. Um, OB oh, is on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio is the largest pet radio network on the planet. We have 7 million listeners to all our shows. Wow. Humbly, my show first aired 2007 and has gone steadily ever since. Uh, we have more than half a million uh, listeners. We've had Betty White on. We've had um, uh, all kinds of people in the celebrity world, in the pet world. We had you on. You were on years ago. And we did it when it used to be with Skype. And we always prayed that the Skype connection would go. And nobody knew what a friggin' podcast was. Now, it, everybody seems, I think my cat's going to get a podcast next. It seems like all of a sudden the world just woke up. So I'm, uh, let me do the math real quick. Um, I'm a 15 year overnight sensation. Actually, wow. Oprah Winfrey has voted my podcast as one of her th favorite three pet podcasts twice in a row. And we've won awards for our podcast, but it is because I bring on great guests like you that are making a difference and people need to hear it. This is something for your ears. So if you talk like this, nobody's gonna tune in. But I do have bad jokes and things like that. But I do my homework on all my guests. I was a newspaper reporter for 20 years, an investigative reporter. So my job is to make that person on the other side of the mic feel like I actually did my homework on them. And they're my guest. I'm not 60 Minutes. And I really, really enjoy it. I mean, I had Betty White on. And she was fantastic. She's great. She's so, great. You, you know, it... it there are now millions of, of podcasts from what I hear. You were the first. And, and clearly, clearly now that I have one of my own, just shows you that they'll let anyone have one out oh, there. Oh, stop so, it, stop it. Um, but just it, don't let my cat have one. I'm, I'm drawing the line at Casey. Well, well when, when Great Grayson gets one, God help us all. But, but yeah. is, there is an interesting fact about me, though. I started I started something like this. I was called Raising Indiana after I after I lost uh, Murphy after Walk Walk Two. Oh, I'm sorry, Walk okay. One, and uh, I was in East Boston at the time, and unfortunately the technology was so bad. We basically I was just I was using a, a recording service over an iPhone, over a phone call, and I had, <laughs> and I had wonderful people like Temple Grandin. Oh wow! And, uh, you know, it was, so it was starting to get good, but I didn't have the right partner. Then the the technology wasn't. I wasn't also technology wasn't good enough. I wasn't really in the right place either. So none of the elements were really there. But that was 2011. But I tell you, it just for me is for me. I, here's where I come out. I'm with you, Arden. I think if you're going to do a show, spend the money and to take the time to do a, a good production quality show. Do as high production quality as you can because you're right. These are important topics and people yeah. need to listen. People need to listen. And somehow your passion has to translate across the waves so that people can stop because what you're talking about saving animals lives is repetition. People need to hear it over and over again. And what I talk about is cancer, which is now the number one killer, including accidental deaths and our canine companions, our loved ones. It's the same thing. So, it's it's great that our paths have reconnected, and I have uh, I, I have picked up the podcast business again, and have a, a good good show, a good concept, and um, and so I, I hope we have a chance to do many more things going forward. We're getting a little bit, uh, we're almost at uh, I think the forty five minute mark. I kind of like to keep an eye on the time. Uh, what are you speaking about that? I could talk to you forever. I have so many questions. <laughs> What are your, are, so your podcast, I mean, this, I, you're in the biz. So are your, your podcast, do you, do you do Zoom? Is this how you podcast now? Yeah, we do Zoom and we get, we really ask our guests, even though it's audio to keep their video on because it makes for a better conversation with right. you. Um, we just had the guy that's on uh, CBS um, Ocean Treks with Jeff Corrin. He now has one called Wildlife uh, Adventures. Uh, uh, so he's a, he's a biologist and he's been on CBS doing all that. We've had the, uh, Brandon McMillan from Lucky Dog on, you know, we've wow. had a lot of great people on, uh, through the years, but having the video part on has really made it more, uh, uh, 
conversational, I guess, you know? It, it is, it, you know, and, and that, that's actually the iPhone 13 and actually the, the advent of the 4K cameras really is, is what- Oh, I agree, yeah. For me, yeah. the 4K cameras is what makes it because I can now turn this into, I can, I can take this, shoot it, and, and take it and split the channels, one into audio and shoot that to podcast and the video, I can break it up and do whatever with it, including putting it into a documentary. So I'm with you. Um, I've never had anybody say audio only. I think I'm only going to do vid video if I have the opportunity. I think it just makes everybody better. Even if it is only audio, it's good for your ears. But don't you feel like you've gotten to know me a little better by seeing Absolutely. the Danny cat and the two dogs and then the acro cat running through? I mean, yeah. that made for, to me, a better, a better connection. Right, right. Um, th that's exactly right. Um, you know, it's interesting, and, and you think about sort of the evolution of, of, of technology and, and podcasts, and that's exactly what, 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 what Zoom has been able to uh, enable us to do. But I do think the ultimate would be able to do the more intimate setting, and that actually has had people in a studio, in a studio setting where the audio and the video quality is so much better. But that's okay. just so, the infrastructure costs with that are so high and yeah. cost prohibitive that it just doesn't make sense. So thank goodness we have the technology to start really doing a better job of getting the information out to pet parents, um, because that's our job. That's my job as well. Yeah. Um, and you do it, and you do it in so many different more forms than I have. Um, as I was, as I was saying to a previous podcast or our previous guest, um, that she's very prolific writer, and I write and research all the time. I'm just not nearly as published as she is. You also publish, and one of the things I love is that you do kids, and you have a oh, kid yeah. and pet book series as well. So talk yeah, about this those. Is, this is my favorite book I've ever written on the planet. It is called A Kid's Guide to Dogs, and it, it came out right during COVID. We were going to go on a 50-city book tour with my publisher. Uh, thank you, not COVID, but it ended up turning out pretty darn well because Parents and grandparents were stuck at home with these kids going, what do we do? And humbly, this book was voted the best book by the Dog Writers of America for kids. And I think what does it is, in the pages of the book, my dog Kona has a running <laughs> sidebar talking to kids. <laughs> <She likes> you. <laughs> and she likes it because we also teach kids how to be poopologists. We have do it yourself in here. Um, it is the best, and then there's a cat version, and my cat Casey talks to the kids, but I'm telling you, they're in their fifth printing in five different languages in over one year. Wow, congratulations. That truly oh, is phenomenal. I think I finally, after all this years, found the- That, that found is, the, and, and, and we were just talking- That's next generation. That's our next generation. Come on, we got to help them. All right, so here's the thing. Okay. All right, so here's, I love to ideate with people all the time. I'm a brainstormer, not know. always so good on the execution end because I've got so many things like a lightning, a lightning rod firing up the old synapses all the time. But what I would like to do with you is, is to, because you're right, is that this knowledge, native knowledge that we're developing and spending our lifetime is getting, we're going to have to pass them on and kids are, are that the way to do that, the conduit to do oh, that. So I would and they're a lot work. smarter than we give them credit for. They're really smart. I don't know about that. I don't have any of <laughs> my own, and but I have six or seven nieces and nephews. I can't remember, um, but I hear that. I read articles about kids and I've learned that. But, but what I would like to do with you though, Arden, is I certainly would love for you and me and Puppy Up to partner with maybe some kids and some maybe some cancer books or something like that. Because the same thing is true with cancer and kids, yeah. because you're, you're right, is that the earlier that you can enrich a child's life, a human kid's life, with, with educating them about the, the benefits of companionship with, with, with dogs and cats and other companions, and okay. how rich you can make that relationship and all the responsibilities that you need to do to take care of that. Because I didn't know that to tell you, I'm not sure how much you know about my history, but I come from Texas. And animals are still not really nowadays. I, I now live in Dallas. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, well, you you missed you missed like the the eighteen hundreds and nineteen hundreds were, and even <laughs> and even now still a little bit. Animals are still chattel down there. So yeah. I grew up in that environment where I didn't know anything about how to care for um, for our, our pets, and I really wasn't what much part of a, Texas, uh, Central Texas, so just north of Austin, outside okay. of Austin. 
right. All um, right. So we weren't we weren't in the sticks. We weren't in the rural Texas, um, but it, it is an interesting environment, especially when you compare that to up to um, like the West Coast and up in the East Coast. Thank you. Um, so whatever we can do to get education out there to successive generations, we need to partner on that. So what yeah. in that same vein, um, Arden, in that same vein about sharing information, as we wrap things up, what are some of the final thoughts that you'd like? to impart to pet parents? I think people need to have a can-do uh, attitude. I think they need to realize that our dogs do feel different emotions. I think they need to realize that it's great to take a doggy vacay, it's great to give them a fancy toy it's, and all that, but giving them good food nutrition. I write the dog nutrition column in every issue of Dogster, which is the largest circulated dog magazine. And I get to work with veterinary nutritionists. Food, as you know, Luke is fuel. So, and the final thing is, I think if I could wave a wand, everyone on this planet that has a pet or cares for pets needs to take some type of pet first aid class you will make a huge difference and you will give them a better, healthier, longer life. Well, I want to just make it to, I'd like to just give you an open invitation now just to be on the <laughs> Fuzzy Butts and Friends once a year as a reminder of that in some shape okay. or form. We'll always, we'll find interesting stories and things because we do want to take up the hour, but I, I think it's a good way to just make that commitment now and have you come on our show and just whatever, go down the, the bullet. Uh, instead of next time, what we'll do is we'll have a list of all the things that we want to cover and we'll just That's run fine. through it. And maybe we'll get Grace in and we'll see if we can do a demo with my knucklehead um, That'd be great. On, on, on your end. I love what you said about food and food being the fuel. We know so little about diet, nutrition in humans, and certainly um, even less so in, in our canine counterparts. I recently had the CEO of Canine Biologics, um, Jeff Sutherland on, and he is a wealth of information. Somebody I highly recommend you have on your program. Um, okay. I hope we can share guests. I would love to do I, that. I don't, I, I'm a collaborator. I'm sorry, I'm not a competitor. I've never have been. I mean- I was, I was joking with that. I, 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 yeah, I was, but I'm I was, just saying, the more good information can be shared, yep. Yep. go for it. I was kidding with that. I, I come from the for-profit world. I have a BBA in finance and accounting. And so even it, it, the world of commerce has changed entirely. I've never been that right. way, especially in terms of research, because what we have is we have way too many proprietary things going and not nearly enough cross-pollination and collaboration, especially when it comes to, to um, issues that, that uh, involve uh, the, the, the safety and health of our our companions, and especially as it, as it, as it concerns diet and nutrition. Um, so oh, yeah. we, we don't, we just do not have enough cross-pollination collaboration. I can speak specifically in the world of cancer and, and, and dogs oh. and, and pets is that I, it's been a frustration of my, four, it's, two days ago were, that was my 14 year anniversary from when I left Austin to Boston, 14 years. Wow. And, that was a year, about two years after I had Malcolm was first diagnosed. So I've been doing this a little while. And so <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been trying to work with uh, human cancer organizations, uh, other animal cancer. I've been trying to collaborate with uh, God knows everybody. And I say it all the time and we, we can't say it enough, but but really it comes down to will. You know, you actually, you said something so appropriate to this very same topic is, is, is it, it's gonna come down to someone taking the leash and taking charge and saying, we're gonna do it. And I know it's because at least I can't speak to the entire animal world and certainly not your, your sphere of concern, but when it comes to cancer and our companion animals, I'm taking the leash now and saying, you know what? We're gonna co collaborate. We're gonna work together, damn it. And we're gonna pull yeah. our resources. We're gonna pull all of our resources. You just so say, I sit, stay, collaborate. <laughs> Listen to your big dog. Listen to your big dog. Yeah, that, that's going to go over well. I can assure you that. No, the world, that's going to go <laughs> real, real well. Um, but 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 in all in all funny, in all good sense of humor, we we have to have a good sense of humor because we we are all passionate about what we do. Yeah. We all have an important message. We're all doing this for someone or some someone we love. 
um, a, a loved one, a human that we lost to cancer, dog we loved to can lost to, dog we lost to cancer, or in your case, whatever the case may be, we're all this is all a passion for us and our mission in life. So that's very important for us to respect, but we, we just have to accelerate the, the collaboration. And I think, Arden, that we, we just, we kind of commit to maybe, to we commit to once a year, you and I getting together, talking right. about going through the list of the things that pet parents need to know about sure. taking care of their pets, um, and then kind of catch up on all the other areas that we need to collaborate. How's that sound? Sounds like a deal, Luke. All right, did I leave anything out, uh, Arden? Well, just people can go to ardenmore.com. Yep. They can go to Pet First Aid For You. That's the letter for the letter U, the number for the letter U. And my Facebook is Arden Moore and the Old Behave Show on Pet Life Radio. I think I've now made everybody in my camp happy. Arden, it's been an honor. Casey, Kona, Emma, you guys were great. Kona already saw in some logs. I can see her back yeah. there. Bless her heart. She is. She is right behind you. She is. She's like look at this one. That, yeah. <laughs> this, this, this is Kate. That's Casey. Look, look at Kona behind you. Look at Kona's. Kona's on behind you. Her head is. Oh, she's. <laughs> I know. We're actually in our backyard office. I have a tiny house in the backyard. It's not a she shed. Your last bad joke. It is Ard's Den. Ard's Den. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for broadcasting from Ard's Den there. Wonderful for having you guys on Fuzzy Butts and Friends. You're always a friend uh, to us, and welcome back on our show anytime. That concludes this episode of Fuzzy Butts and Friends. Puppy up. Talk soon. <laughs>